Hey, thank you, um, Ken, for that introduction. Thank you to the Planning Committee for the invitation. And thank you to Oren and uh, colleagues for inviting me. Um, before I, I start in on my, my remarks with slides, I, I think I, I need to say um, congratulations. You'll notice that in addition to this being uh, the, the Congress, the 24th Congress, the slides not up there. We also have really the birth of a new initiative at the Faculty of Medicine at Tel Aviv University. Um, uh, and an important um, demarcation, really, of the beginning of an important program, which I hope will be uh, something that works together with the uh, World Association and, I hope, partners with my institute and others in the United States. It made me think we're, we're here in, um, in Tel Aviv. Ken asked if I had a Hebrew name, and I said, only when I get called to the Torah or when it was by bar mitzvah. Um, but it reminds me of um, the famous quote from Theodore Herzl. Since we're sitting in Tel Aviv, it seemed important to say something um, relevant to the country in which we're sitting. So he said in Hebrew, Im tirtzu enzo agada. If you will it, it is not a dream. And so that was about the birth of the modern state of Israel, but it's apropos, I think, because it's the birth of a new program in bioethics at Tel Aviv University. So, Mazal Tov. Let me, let me um, launch into my remarks. You see the title of my talk, which is really, uh, as Ken said, an attempt to connect what we do in bioethics and medical ethics and to the extent that medical law thinks of itself as working in bioethics to the real problems that the world is facing. And, and I'll try to, to make an argument about why we haven't focused on quite the right things up till now. To start, though, I need to tell you a little bit about myself. So I grew up in Los Angeles. I'm a nice Jewish boy from the suburbs of Los Angeles. My wife, Orly, who's here, is actually of Israeli parents, so we try to spend a lot of time here in Israel when we can. But when I was a teenager, before I met my now wife, I, I spent a lot of time in a small uh, community in the northwest part of the state of Washington. I'm going to show you a map in a second. It's called Nia Bay. It's on the Macaw Indian Reservation, and it looks like that today, and it looked like that when I was a teenager there uh, 45 years ago. I'm older than I look. And it's, it's a place that doesn't have great access to health care, and the individuals who live there suffer from chronic diseases that you would mostly find in developing parts of the world. And I was quite shocked by that as a teenage boy from Southern California, that there would be people in the United States living with alcoholism and uh, poverty and all the ills that come from that. There's a museum there, which is why I was there, of artifacts that came from an archaeological dig. And my aunt and uncle were PhD students working on their dissertations there, which is why I summered with them in this very, to me, very interesting but different place. Here's a map. So this is a, a, a map of the state of Washington, which is the northwestern part of the United States of America. That little red uh, square is where the site of the archaeological dig was. There's a, a box which shows you where that part of the United States is, and in the inset there, there's a rectangle which shows you where that part of the U.S. is, just to give you a, a sense. Okay? Far from, from where I grew up, far from here, certainly, but a first world country where we were suffering from third world health issues. And that stuck with me. I was a 13, 14-year-old boy. So public health is important. That's sort of the takeaway there from that little personal story. And that's probably difficult to dispute. No one in the room would argue with that. What are the pressing issues in global health, so public health from a global population basis today? And these are taken from the Sustainable Development Goals, which are, of course, famous and very high level, but it gives you a sense. And I have, have really summarized here. So, Reduce maternal, infant, and childhood mortality. So people shouldn't die during childbirth. Babies should survive. End epidemics of infectious disease, in particular AIDS, TB, malaria. You see the list there. Combat hepatitis, waterborne diseases, and other communicable diseases. Reduce premature mortality from non-communicable diseases and violence-related deaths, things like road um, traffic injury and um, violence individual against individual. 
strengthen the prevention and treatment of drug abuse. We're having a huge issue in the U.S. at the moment around opioid addiction and its effects on our population. You know, that's not a U.S. unique problem. Reduce deaths and illnesses from hazardous chemicals, air, water, soil pollution. So this is degradation of the environment in which we all live. No one would argue that these are not pressing either, but they're not the areas that we tend to work on. So thinking ahead, so those are the sustainable development goal areas which have been with us for a while now. What will we be facing in the future? So conflict, we're sitting in a region that knows conflict only too well, unfortunately. And conflict around the world seems to be only increasing, not decreasing. Climate change and environmental degradation. So that's doing all sorts of things to the places where we live. It's changing uh, our ability to access food, access clean water, and, and we're degrading our environment by the uses of energy that we um, both take from the ground and then uh, combust to, to create electricity. Inequality of income is actually worsening, not getting better. And all of this leads to cycles of migration, stress on state level capacities to, to care for people in the social safety net as well as area of health. And as populations age, there's increasing stresses due to chronic diseases in stable countries like Israel, like the United States. And that will only increase stress on the health systems that are trying to care for their populations. There's a health system here in, the, in Israel. I'm not sure that we have a health system in the US, but we sometimes try to at least create something like a health system in the US. Editorial comment. So in ethics and healthcare, the kinds of places I work, so I work in sort of the, at a palace of the best medical and healthcare and public health research in the world, right, at Johns Hopkins. Technology is advancing in ways that are increasingly focusing on health and improving health and, and in really interesting ways, ways that raise really interesting ethical and policy issues. So we hear a lot about artificial intelligence, AI, the use of big data, trying to suck up data from all the things that happen in our lives, whether it be the electronic, electronic health record, medical record, EMR, EHI, electronic health information, from wearables, I have an Apple Watch on, I'm sure you all have something like that, or the phone you carry in your pocket, is continuously collecting data. It's all being now used in ways that can help predict and hopefully treat uh, what's going on with our own health. Genomic sciences are advancing rapidly. Right? We went from mapping the human genome to now being able to edit genes in anything that's got DNA. So we can both now predict in ways we could not before at a genetic level what was going to happen to people, and increasingly we think we can intervene. So change people at the genomic level as a way of treating their health issues. Interesting and important, raising ethical issues. And a sort of hot of the moment topic is the area of brain science, neuroscience, where we have in the US something called the Brain Initiative. That's an acronym, which is effectively the Human Genome Project for mapping the brain, trying to understand the neural pathways in ways that can both inform why people, some people get what we think of as mental illness or diseases of, of, um, related to neurology, um, and maybe doing something about them. So it's both as a matter of diagnosis, but also of treatment. In the EU, it's called the Human Brain Project, and then there's something that's a uh, combination of both the US, EU, and countries across the world called the Joint International Brain Initiative. So trying to get at the brain in the way that we have, have made some progress at the human genome level. So these are all really interesting, really important advances in technology, which don't have obvious ways of matching up with those issues that I showed on the last two slides. So how do we marry or connect up or at least apply this advancing technology and the ethical issues that arise in it with issues of global health? So I'll talk more about that in a second, more than a second, in a minute. So let me talk for a, a, a moment here about what issues we do work on. And, and I use bioethics here in the broadest possible sense. So I think that you all who do medical law do bioethics, as do I. I'm trained as a philosopher. My, my doctoral training is in philosophy. I have a master's in public health. But my first degree, my bachelor's degree, was in molecular biology. So I started in science. Right? That's a 
very interdisciplinary background in one person. People who do bioethics come from a, a very widely interdisciplinary set of areas. All of you do what I would think of as bioethics. So what are we working on? This is a very difficult to see image, and there's a reason for that. The point being, you'll understand in a second, it's just a cloud of all of the topics in the mesh heading. So that's the, um, the US MedCat. That's all of the medical which includes bioethics literature, published in English, so it excludes non-English language. All papers that were bioethics related between the years of 2007 and 2017. It's a little small in the upper right corner, and the number there is 108,000 and change, 108,646. Okay, that, that's just to give you a sense of the scale and scope. That arrow points at all the bioethics papers that have global health as part of their Topic. Now, there's a very rough kind of estimate, but let's just call that 1%. Right? 823 is the number of th that corresponds to that dot that the red arrow is pointing to. So of the 108,000 plus total number of bioethics papers published in those 10 years, 823 had something to do with global health, 1%. And that's to give you a sense of the 823 papers, what the topic areas were. So you, you, it's not important to know what those are. The biggest balls are the largest numbers of papers. So social justice, human rights, it would be the predictable things. Okay, so this gives you a sense of sort of where the, the scholarly work, the output of people who do bioethics is focusing. It's not meant to be so qu quantitative that you're gonna now take home, well, there were 108,646 papers published, that's not the point. The point is a small percentage of them focus on the things that I showed you on those first two slides about the topics that seem to be affecting the world. So why is, is this mismatch occurring? It'd be easy for you all to think about in your own lives why you work on what you do and why you don't work on other things. But let me offer you some general ideas. The history of the field, the field of bioethics, was born in the context of biomedicine. And in the US, which is where I know best, the reason that people get paid to work in bioethics is because they work in medical schools, where medical schools require medical ethics to be taught to medical students. It's expanded from that, but that was the reason for being for bioethics in the United States. And it was in, I'm gonna say this again later, in response to bad things being done to people, whether it was in the medical context or the biomedical research context. So it's a reaction. We need people who to focus on ethics and teach the next generation of professionals how to be right, how to do things the right way. I don't believe that we can actually do that, but that was sort of the goal, and that's why we work in the area where we do. So our, our history determines where we work and who pays us and what they want us to work on. Right? So the focus has been on ethics, law, policy, delivery of care, and in biomedical research. That's been where we've been asked to work, and so that's where we publish. So delivery of care, research on human subjects. We focused on the historic mistreatment of individuals. We have a, a litany of bad cases, and we don't need many to sort of steal the public um, understanding of, of science going awry. And so in the United States, Congress got involved, and once Congress gets involved, it becomes political, and so on and so forth. So we've tried, I think, as a field, and I would put the birth of the sort of modern scholarly field of bioethics as only middle 1970s in the US, which I think is a fair sort of place to talk about it from an international perspective. Not to say that medical ethics didn't exist before, but of, of course it did. There's been medical ethics as long as there's been medicine, but the academic scholarly field of study called bioethics really since only the 1970s. And we've tried to generalize the lessons learned from this focus in biomedicine to inform other discussions and certainly to inform policy, but how well have we done that? And I'm arguing not so well. Part of the reason is not just where we work, but the kinds of framing, sort of the approaches that we've taken and applied to issues have been wrong for public health global health kinds of questions. So traditional bioethics doesn't map well onto public health issues. 
So the approaches that I grew up learning about, so I went to Georgetown to do my PhD, Georgetown University in Washington, DC. I studied with Tom Beecham, who's famous in the world of bioethics for having written with Jim Childress, Principles of Biomedical Ethics, a book that all of you have read, probably in your native language. It's been translated into pretty much every language on the face of the globe, right? And the four principles that are certainly expanded upon, discussed at great length, but the four principles that people take from that work are the four you see here. But those don't really work well outside of biomedicine. They don't work well in public health. They don't work well in global health because autonomy doesn't mean as much in the context of global and public health as it does in doctor, patient, healthcare provider, patient, researcher, subject relationships. So there's a misfit. We've tried to focus in different ways. L later, more recently, my colleague Nancy Cass wrote a quite well-known paper in 2001 trying to lay out principles or an approach for public health ethics. And for her, and it's been quite, I think, um, uh, it's had a fair amount of traction, her approach. It's really values-informed considerations of issues of public health, focusing more on social justice and rights than autonomy, beneficence, right? Justice from the perspective of thinking about who's involved in research and who gets access to scarce resources. A few years later, a group led by Sully Benatar, Cape Town, along with Peter Singer and Dar at the University of Toronto, wrote about global health challenges and the ethical issues that were, were important there and the approach that we ought to use to frame um, attention to those issues. And you see them listed here. They argued, rightly, and I would say 2005 and 2018 have a lot of the same issues, threats to life, health, and security as a result of widening disparities in wealth, health, and knowledge and changes in the world are the most pressing issues of the day. That was 2005, 13 years later, still true. Achieving improved health for a greater proportion of the world's population is one of the most pressing problems of our time. True in 2005, true again in 2018. Values that, that pay an essential role in working towards this goal are what we should be focusing on. Okay, so this is just sort of echoing what others have, have said. There are different ways to think about framing ethics in the context of global health as compared to biomedicine and biomedical research. We'll have more issues to deal with in the future. They're not going away anytime soon. So this is the depressing part of the talk. Okay, so why don't we spend more time on these issues? You saw the first little glimpse of that before. Here are some more. Where we work matters a lot. And here's my US idiosyncratic, US-centric snapshot. There's an association of the directors of bioethics programs do the jobs that, like I do, but around North America. So it's US and Canada. 73 members, the vast majority, all but probably two or three of the faculty for those programs are appointed in departments within the health professions, mostly medicine, a few nursing, and a few in public health, pharmacy, allied science, health, allied health sciences, and life sciences. So we, we work in places where the issues are different than global health issues. The second is who funds our work and what they pay us to work on. So we're all you know, creatures that respond well to incentives. The pri budget priorities reflect what is valued and what we will spend time on. And the institutions where we work want us to do particular things. They want us to educate students. You heard me talk about that before. They want service and committee leadership around clinical and research ethics and consultation. That's a core need that needs to be met but it needs to be, I would say, in addition to that, not only that. Again, this is my a, a bit broader than US take on what also is happening. The funders of the projects and research that we carry out have particular agendas, right? They fund the things that they think are important. The National Institutes of Health in the US drives research agenda, not just in bioethics, of course, but in everything. People became, all virologists became HIV virologists because that's where the money was. It's, it's not a surprise and that's just the way the world works. If you look outside of government, so the Wellcome Trust, which is a, of course a large um, 
um, non, a charity it's called in the UK, but it means something different in the UK than it does in places like the US or Israel. They're not people who need money, they give away large sums of money. That's from the um, Burroughs Welcome Fortune. Gates Foundation are more focused on pu public health, global health issues, but less interested in bioethics issues, it turns out. I think that's turning a little bit, but it's not been a core area of their investment. And then private philanthropy. We've been very fortunate at Johns Hopkins to actually raise a very significant amount of private philanthropy, but we live at the top of the heap in the U.S. in that regard, and we have raised in the course of the history of the Berman Institute uh, something like 65 million U.S. dollars. That's a lot for us, but that's not a lot in terms of the scope of philanthropy in the United States. So lastly, and maybe most important, what we're rewarded for. So the places we're appointed, so what you, you didn't get in, in Ken's short introduction was where I actually have a professorship, which in my institution is a school of public health. I'm a full professor, so I don't need to worry about promotion, but my colleagues do. And they are appointed in public health, medicine, nursing, one in philosophy, a couple in history of medicine. So they have to work and publish in the areas where their colleagues will recognize what they do in a way that they can advance from assistant to associate to full professor and get tenure. And of course, they need to get grants. So they get grants in the places that people will fund, not necessarily the places where they you know, most passionately want to work. Hopefully those things mad, match up, but not always. Okay, so our focus is appropriately a product of all these factors together. This is a hard nut to crack, it turns out. When you look at all of this and the history, how do we turn the, the ship a little bit? I'm not asking that we make a 180 degree or even a 90 degree turn, but we, we need to, I think, expand. So here are some examples of how we might do that. This will be the last bit of my talk. Humanitarian health, and I know many of you do work in humanitarian health, and, and in fact, there are more people in places like Johns Hopkins who, we have a center for humanitarian health, who want to work on uh, ethical issues that they face with us. When is it appropriate to say we can't go into that conflict zone, this is happening in Syria as we speak, it's just too dangerous for the aid providers, for the physicians and healthcare workers to go in and help. It's not safe, and therefore it's, it's unethical for us to put people in harm's way when we know people are, are die, will die as a result. They're trying to figure out that calculus. Infectious disease-related issues are not going away, and I won't go through the list here, but there are lots of really interesting issues that are um, growing, not, not shrinking from HIV, AIDS to Zika, new emerging outbreaks, vaccine development and challenge trials which are required to do those where we actually intentionally expose people or let them be exposed to infectious disease after um, in, in using a new vaccine on them. It raises really interesting ethical and policy and legal issues. And we have a, an interesting story evolving um, led by the Gates Foundation in the US, but it's obviously a worldwide effort to treat um, young girls with one or maybe two doses of HPV vaccine, which provides some protection, even if it won't provide as much as a typical th three-dose regimen. So it's a, a little bit of, or, or a lot of protection, but not as much as you would get from three, enough if we can give one dose to many more people. Interesting sort of utilitarian trade-off. I had to think about that. Health systems research. Priority setting for health resources. I'll show you now one more picture since we're getting a lot of words here. We're sitting not far, of course, from Egypt. Egypt is actually, has the largest prevalence of hepatitis C in the world. People know that story. It's a kind of terrible public health tragedy where they had an infected um, therapeutic that they ended up um, infecting lots of people accidentally over the course of time, and hep, hep C spreads very readily and very easily by sex and IV drug use. So hepatitis C uh, treatment, of course, is now available, but extremely expensive, right? The new drugs to treat hepatitis C are very, very effective, very expensive in developed countries, less expensive in developing countries, but nonetheless um, cost a lot when you're talking about large populations. So what to do about it is something that Egypt is on the forefront of working on. Here's the connection to ethics and technology. So this is a paper that my colleagues and I just published. It's actually a letter to the editor in response to a paper saying that genomic testing of individuals on a population-wide basis in Egypt might show 
would show actually that some proportion of those people will clear the hepatitis C virus on their own without therapy at something like 75% rate. So those who have a particular genomic makeup should be identified and not treated with the expensive therapeutics until we know that they're not going to clear it themselves. In the meantime, they'll infect other people. In the meantime, if they're pregnant women, not good for their pregnancy, not good for the developing fetus. And so this is an argument about the ethics. We're saying that's not ethical, as you probably could tell by the way I set it up, to use genomic testing as a way of effectively rationing what would, would be a scarce drug resource. All right, so mirroring up technology, the kind of high-tech bioethics that we have grown up doing to a global health issue. Food, energy, and water issues could occupy us all for our entire careers if we wanted to work on them. And then increasingly human-animal interaction, so sometimes called One Health. So to finish up, let me just sort of wrap up here so it'll be a little bit more depressing news, but hopefully I can um, end on a little bit of an up upbeat note. So no matter what some leaders of countries in the world say, the underlying factors like climate change and conflict are not going away but will continue. Climate change is only getting worse. Migration as a cause, at least in part of climate change, will only continue. What can we do to address the mismatch? So global health deserves more attention, as, as I've showed in that one little example of hepatitis C and the Egyptian context, matching up in ways that are more thoughtful and foresightful global health ethics law and policy work will be important. And we need to work with funders. And I, I would say in, in the US, at least, we have an opportunity to do this. The leadership of the NIH is very willing to talk with the leadership of the bioethics community about where the resources ought to be put. So we have made a case, pardon me, not that we need more money, although of course we would like it, but that we want the money focused in different ways. Spread it around to focus on some of the kinds of issues I've talked about and less on the sort of continued emphasis on what we're doing in genomic technologies and what the ethical, legal, and social policy issues are related to that. With a little bit of, of at least listening and we hope some change. As I said, welcome and Gates, I think will come along, welcome uh, ahead of Gates, but once one starts, maybe the other will follow. I think now, this is my pitch about standing here in Tel Aviv when I work in Baltimore, Maryland, is that we need to expand our circle and collaborate more transnationally. Uh, the project that's now just kicking off with the Ethox group at Oxford, where we'll work together on ethics and infectious disease um, questions. And we need wider, greater interdisciplinary inclusion. So not the typical sus suspects. So more behavioral economics, political science, and so on among the people who work with us and do more what we, uh, at least in the US, call embedded ethics. So we have people working on ethical issues in the context of other kinds of research projects. So they're not solely funded ethics projects, they're ethics people to pay to work in other kinds of scientific, global health, in this case, projects. And we need to hire faculty that want to work in these areas. They'll be successful if this is where they want to work, right? We can ask people to, we can seek people to work in the same kinds of things we've always worked on and we can look for different kinds of emphases. And so I would say, at least in my institute, we're, we're doing that. We're actually trying to hire people who have somewhat more global looking um, ideas and I hope will grow um, a, a group that will be focused in this area going forward. And we need to publish with a policy focus and do that in places that are maybe not the places that showed up in that scatter cloud plot that I showed you, which is the academic literature. We need to do better at reaching out to the non-academic audiences that um, need to hear what we have to say about these issues. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. I do want to say one last thing, and this is to maybe put a little bow on my connection to being here in Israel. So I started with Herzl. I'll, I'll end with Pirkei Avot, which in English is usually translated as the ethics of our fathers. And Rabbi Tarfun said something very famous, which I'm sure many of you in the audience will remember, which, which goes something like this in English, it's not your responsibility to finish the work of protecting the world, but you are not free to desist from it either. So let us take this on together. Again, Mazel Tov, or into the birth of the new project, and I hope this uh, proves to be a great conference for you all.
Thank you.